Hey, this is Adam from Edge. I'm here with Paul Cook. How are you doing, Paul? Great. How are you today? I'm doing great. Tell me what your job is. So I'm a director in the Windows client organization. I'm responsible for keeping track of the enterprise value proposition within Windows client. Specifically, I handle all the security components that an enterprise might care about. So things like BitLocker and, and UAC and other things from an enterprise standpoint. Okay. So we've talked about BitLocker before on Edge. Now there's a new security feature I've heard about called AppLocker. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, AppLocker is really a new technology in Windows 7 to, to give IT control over the applications that they can run in their environment. Okay. So it sounds a little, at first blush a little bit like you know the software restriction sounds policies. Like soft, SRP, yeah. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like it, but fundamentally it's, it's quite a bit different. We've made huge investments and made changes in the way the whole technology works. So being able to do things like use um, digital signatures to validate applications and allow those to run an environment. Just not something you can do with SRP because really the easiest way in SRP is to use path rules mm -hmm. or to use hash rules, right? right? In path rules, well, if a user has access, they can just move files into a, a known path and, and get around some of the restriction policies. And from an IT standpoint, if you use these hash rules, every time you want to push out an update, you've got to go out and push the update, update all the rules, and it's doable. Lots of organizations use it. People are doing it, sure. Yeah, but it's it's a little more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. So how how is AppLocker fixing that? How have we solved that problem with AppLocker? What is it, what does it do differently? Well, two major areas, actually three, if we really look at it. You know, first and foremost, we can start to now create rules based on executables. We can do scripts. We can installers. And for those advanced organizations, we can even sit there and whitelist DLLs, if you will. Um, so that's one big thing and a leap that SRP doesn't give us. Okay. The other is you know, these digital signatures, something in Windows 7 we're calling publisher rules. So the, be, the ability to use the information contained in a digitally signed app to be able to control its execution. So I can say things like allow all versions of Office greater than, you know, say, 12.0 that are signed by Microsoft to run in my environment. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. And the last is really being able to do it based on a per user basis. So there might be a need for, you know, and from a PCI compliance standpoint, to restrict applications based on users. Mm -hmm. So think about finance apps and stuff. Even as a, a, an administrator on a box, if I'm there, should I even be able to run the finance app? Eh, actually, probably not. So I can actually control it based on groups of users or specific users oh, cool. so that only those users can run these applications. Okay. You mentioned whitelisting. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between blacklisting and whitelisting for applications? Yeah. So whitelisting is really creating a list of things that you want to run in your environment. The things that are known set of things that you want to run in your environment are, are quite a bit smaller than those unknown things. And that's mm -hmm. really blacklisting where you start saying, I don't want X to run in my environment or Y. The problem is, is there's a lot more X and Y out there, potentially, that your users are going to download and try mm -hmm. to run. It becomes an arms race, right? Oh, you keep up with that list. And you can never keep up with it. So that way, whitelisting is really makes it easier to control what's running in your environment, as opposed to trying to block all known bad. You're just never going to be able to keep yeah. up. Okay. Um, sounds cool. You have something you can show us? Yeah, we've got some stuff here we can kind of walk through and, okay. and give you a look. All right, let's take a look. So I've got up the local group policy editor, and I've got a set of application control policies for AppLocker. As we can see, I can do executable rules, installer rules, scripts. And I've got a couple rules in place on this machine. You know, the first one here is one of the default rules, and it allows anything in the Windows directory to run. And then I've got a, another rule here that basically says if it's something in the program files directory, I'm going to allow that to run. So you'll notice that these are path rules. And to kind of ease folks into it, the default rules are path rules, so people can kind of start to wrap their heads around this. Because obviously, if you, you jump right in and you mess up your whitelist, it's pretty easy to get the machine into a situation where it may not even run, much less boot. OK. We could, we could literally exclude the Windows directory, and Windows doesn't run itself. And Windows wouldn't even, after it started, nothing else would run. <laughs> so okay. obviously, you know, a scenario we want to ease our enterprise customers and other folks into so that they understand the implications. So the default rules are kind of that safety area, if you will. Give them a sandbox that you can play in without cutting off your foot. Okay. Can you just tell me what uh, installer rules and script rules do? What... So installer rules, um, if I have like an MSI or an MSU file, mm -hmm. I can actually um, 
put up a share within my organization and say, I'm going to allow you know, any of the, the signed rules that live out here in the share to potentially be run in an environment. Okay. So that way I can control what happens in my environment from an IT perspective, but I can you know, empower users to be able to run things and, and decide when to update themselves. Okay, so I could give them kind of a cafeteria style, here's some apps available to you. Exactly, okay. and so make it easier for them. You allow them to run, but you know, allow them to go out and install them. Cool, okay. So we've got a, these two rules in place, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things I, I do want to point out, one of the, the differences really when we look at what's allowed in SRP versus the new app locker policies is I have this concept of exceptions. It really allows me to create a hole in a rule. With SRP, you'd have to create a blacklist entry to exclude something. Mm -hmm. And well, once you do that, well, how do you let anybody actually run it? Exclusions make it much easier for you to manage things in your environment. Okay. So I actually have one exception in this rule. So anything in program files Adobe can't run. Currently excluding. Okay. Yeah, so it's not actually excluding. It's not including, which is kind of an interesting concept for people to wrap their heads around. Okay. Right? I get that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the rule. And if we try to run Adobe, you'll notice that it's blocked. I can't actually run it because I've created that hole in the rule that allows everything in program files to actually run. So let's see how easy it is to actually create a rule for Adobe. So I'm going to right click, I'm going to say create new rule, and I'm going to allow, in this case I'm going to allow everyone, but I may sure. say, you know, Adam, I like you, I'm going to only allow you to run Adobe. Okay. But clearly Adobe is one of those apps that everybody needs in an organization, so mm -hmm. we're going to allow everybody to do it. And I'm going to use one of these new publisher rules so we can really get a sense of how these digital signatures work. So I'm going to browse to my Adobe directory. And what I'll do is actually pull the digital signature information right off of the Acrobat Reader executable. And as you can see, it pulls the information and pre-populates mm -hmm. the information here for me to utilize in the wizard. I also have this slider over here so I can start to make choices in my organization. You know, maybe I want to allow anything signed by Adobe to run. You know, maybe oh, wow. I just want Adobe Reader to run, right? Okay, cool. You know, or maybe just the Acrobat 32.exe is all I want to run. In this case, we're going to we're going to just kind of keep the defaults and say if it's Acrobat 32 signed by Adobe and it's version 8.1 or greater, let's allow that to run. So let me go ahead and just create that rule. We can see it pops up here. Mm -hmm. And now if I double click on Adobe Reader, it launches and runs. So as we can see, it's really easy for IT to go through and create rules for their environment. Oh, that's cool. So one last thing that's kind of interesting is, you know, maybe I didn't have this rule in place before. Let me go ahead and just delete it. We're going to get rid of it. But I have a reference machine that has all the different executables and things I need in my environment to run. Mm -hmm. So I can easily go through and I can use this option here to automatically generate rules. So anything in program files, I'm going to have to go through and I'm going to let everyone run it because this is a reference machine for my organization. And I want to create publisher rules by default because it's going to be easier for me to manage, mm -hmm. going back to those hashes and path, and path rules. Right. So it's going to be easier for me long term to do it. Unfortunately, not everything is digitally signed nowadays. Okay. A lot of internal apps aren't necessarily signed, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So for those, I'm going to go ahead and do a hash rule. I'm going to let it automatically generate those. So I click Next. And the system goes through and analyzes all the files that are out there and figures out what needs to be done. So I can actually preview the rules that are going to be installed. All right, so this, this literally went through, looked at any apps that were installed, and created rules to allow those. Yeah, and we can see there's cool. a number of things signed by Microsoft that should be allowed. And, well, there's some other things here that aren't signed that need to run. Okay. So it's literally that easy to create a set of rules for an organization once they have a reference machine put in place. Cool. So, Paul, this is great stuff. Where can I go to get more information on AppLocker? Well, we've just released the beta right. of Windows 7. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's a lot of great content coming. So my best advice is, you know, keep an eye on your favorite TechNet site and um, step-by-step -step guides and other documentation that really will help you understand how AppLocker works around their way. They're just not available at the early stages of the beta process. All right. We'll keep an eye out. Thanks, okay. man. Thank you.